Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Deborah Thien, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at California State University, Long Beach. I'm meeting today with Professor Emeritus Craig Stone to talk about his more than 40 year career at Cal State Long Beach, as well as the history and the importance of the American Indian Studies Program and Pavagna, an ancient but also contemporary gathering place for California Indian peoples. It's a pleasure to be with you here, Professor Stone. Thank you for having me, Dean Thien. <laughs> so I heard that you first came to our campus for the powwow in the 1970s, and you went from powwow participant to undergraduate student. Why did you want to study at Cal State Long Beach? Well, um, we always came to the powwows uh, at Cal State Long Beach and UCLA. Those were the two schools that were significant. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were part of the Red Power Movement. People came from um, Cal State Long Beach and UCLA went up, uh, were part of um, the occupation of Alcatraz, along with folks from Davis, uh, um, um, Berkeley, and San Francisco. So um, we came to powwows just to dance and, uh, and, and did that, and that's how we knew Cal State Long Beach. Uh, in 1975, um, a group that I was involved with, the Trishulkai Indian Club, uh, there were several people in that club, Charlotte Standing Buffalo and the Red Door family. Um, they were um, affiliated with Cal State Long Beach, and they asked us to come and sing and to dance and do a cultural presentation in the small auditorium of the student union. Mm -hmm. And that's because it had changed from American Indian Day to American Indian Week. And I spoke, and Charlotte Standing Buffalo spoke, and uh, we did this presentation. And then after the presentation, there were students and faculty who came uh, and counselors, and they took us on a tour. And they took us upstairs to the American Indian Student Council room. And we went in there, and there were three individuals in there, all of them kind of well-known, you know. Charles Kozad, Charlie Brown, um, and uh, he, he will probably be our head singer at this year's powwow, mm -hmm. some 47 years later when wow. I first met him. And then, um, and then an Indian actor, Vince St. Cyr, and then, uh, and then uh, Sabu Romanos. And they welcomed us, and they, said, and they said, look around. And we looked, and there was, a, uh, there was a bulletin board. And we all went over and looked at the bulletin board, and we saw all these people we knew, all these good people who were really active in the Southern California Indian community, and like people that ran food banks, people that ran uh, different s service organizations, all these people. And we said, are these guys somehow affiliated with Cal State Long Beach? And they said, yeah. They said, yeah. And we go, so we started going over names. So that was really interesting because my perception of university was an academic programs was that those were folks that studied people, they had nothing to do with the community, mm. they were not engaged at all, and, and so that was a real shocker, right? And, and then the next semester, uh, they helped us fill out forms to apply, and I, I came the next semester. So you really got pulled in by that community aspect. You came in as a community member, and then you got to see that happen. Yeah, it was yeah. shocking. It's like, oh my gosh, Melvin Deer, he teaches here. And so like these are people that you knew. So is you know? this what led you to want to become a professor? That's a weird thing. Uh, and when I was in high school, my teacher, his name's Bob Bella. He was a, had an MFA from Claremont Graduate University. And uh, later I was a visiting artist at that, at that place. But Bob, when I was young, a uh, sophomore and junior in high school, he, 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 um, said, you'd be a good teacher, why don't you teach for the junior high? So I, so he would go over art lessons and then I would teach him. So uh, for me, most of the time, like I was a singer and dancer, most of the time it's other people telling me, you have a talent for that or you have a gift for that. Or And so I was encouraged to do things. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like me thinking, oh, I need to do this. It was it was more people seeing something mm -hmm. in me and saying, okay, so that's what I try to do as a teacher is see that in students and then try to encourage them or new faculty or whatever, you know, it's it's to try to um, 
see see what their talents are mm-hmm. and encourage that. Yeah, so kind of pay it forward from your own experience as well. Yeah. So speaking of your professor career, you've had a joint appointment, one of probably a, only a few people on campus that crosses two colleges, you in the College of Liberal Arts yeah. and also the College of the Arts. So what, what has that been like being in those two academic worlds? Well, when it first started, um, I took a class in the School of Art. It was called American Indian Art, uh, a Western perspective. So in that class, um, what they taught was Jungian psychology, Freudian psychology, universal aesthetics, formalism, theory and elements of design. And they, they looked at American Indian art, decontextualized from context. So you'd look at a piece of artwork that was American Indian made, but you didn't learn anything about American Indians or culture or anything. What you learned about was these European concepts of art, how to look at art, connoisseurship. Mm. So you really did learn about the Western art world and all those concepts. In the American Indian Studies class, Carol Whaley Miller taught this class. She's went to. And uh, and so she was my teacher. And Carol, uh, when they when they taught there, it wasn't an expert saying this is what these people read. She would tell you um, what the literature said, what we know, and then she'd look in the class. And at that time, you'd have 60 American Indian students in the class. Wow. Yeah. You know, Indian studies started uh, in 1968. We're the oldest. But the reason why we started was be, uh, because they recruited, because of EOP, they sent letters out to all these people of color. So it's first generation uh, coming into the university. And that first generation, uh, the first class they taught is a class that um, um, Larry Benangus designed. And and those students were not prepared in Bureau of Indian Affairs schools to come to the university. Uh, it, there was no college preparatory. You know, my my cousin, Joanne, taught for Intermountain Intertribal High. And she caught, taught cosmetology, how to cut hair. So it was all vocational. Hmm. So when those first Native students showed up on campus, Larry, Larry said, he's from Barona Reservation <clears throat> down in San Diego. So his family's connected to Pavungna. So that's part of the complex. So um, Larry created a class that was like University 100 for American Indian students who... Uh, did not have access to uh, college prep, so so it was how to how to be successful as a student. That's how that's how our first classes started. Mm. You have an incredible memory going back to those classes. There were so many good people. Yeah, I have so many mentors, and that's the thing. You know, like you want to mention all their names because they were really helpful. Mm. To talk a little bit more about your re- relationship in the two colleges. Talk about the difference between being an artist in American Indian Studies in the College of Liberal Arts and being an artist in the College of Arts. One of the things, I was tenured full professor in two different colleges, and one of the things that you, you learn is the, what assets we have, what th- good things we have, and what good things they have, and what they're missing, you know? And so um, in the School of the Arts, it's you know, very much about being an individual, individual genius, individual agency, you know, so it's kind of the story of individuals, you know, and then, uh, and then in the, in American Indian studies, it's much more horizontal, you know, it's not, it's much more uh, consensus building. When we went to higher faculty, 60 people, 70 people would come and they would decide who's going to teach the American Indian studies classes, community members, faculty in the school of art, it would be one person deciding. So one's very, very vertical. Um, and <clears throat> as an artist, um, um, a lot of these ideas that that were just common, like at the powwow, you know, our ideas that everybody comes there and we're focusing on how people are interrelated and that we're hosting people mm-hmm. and trying to make those people feel very comfortable. At the same time, we're platforming. We're, we're trying to get people to uh, feel comfortable speaking their language, composing new songs, making new regalia, you know, trying to support the Native community and showcase all these different people 
um, who have uh, done these things in the community. So in the art world, there, the, uh, there was something called public art, art in public places. And, uh, and so I, I actually designed the first course in the United States at a university for what's called uh, public art. And that was with Jorge Pardo and Patrick Moore with CSU Some Arts. And we taught design team collaboration, how to work in a community in order to create public space that was similar to this idea of powwow, that this is a place where y'all feel good coming together. If you go to the top of Signal Hill, I designed that space and all kinds of stuff. But, um, but so that was actually like taking some of these values and putting them into uh, the art world. And the art world was ready for that. And speaking of your design and creation, you also created the logo for American Indian Studies. Yeah, so when we were students, uh, we had all these really bright women, uh, Native women, uh, um, Mary Claycorn Van, Charlotte Standing Buffalo, uh, um, just all these different people, Paula Star um, and And so we were sitting around and, and, and they were saying, we need to have a conference to recruit American Indian students. And, and so one of the first conferences was created at Cal State Long Beach to do this. And, and we called it ALOT, it's an acronym, American Indian Leaders of Today and Tomorrow, hmm. Higher Education and Career Conference. So we were saying, okay, well, what would the headdress be for, for uh, new Indian leaders? And, and we we're brainstorming and someone said, well, hey, you know, maybe a, like a mortarboard, like, you know, a graduation cap. And, and so I had these skill sets, uh, I tanned leather and beadwork and all this. So, 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 uh, so they proposed that I would make this hat and I did out of leather and beaded it, put an eagle feather on it. Then we photographed that hat and, um, and then Irvin, uh, my best friend, he, he made up a phrase and it said, in grandfather's time, knowledge of the world is the power. In this generation, knowledge is the power of the world. Something like that. Anyway, so, so <laughs> Urban came up with this phrase, you know, and, uh, and so that became our poster. And, and that mortarboard and eagle feather became um, an image or icon of Indian education. It went out and then they exhibited it for many years at the county museum. But what was significant to me uh, was that because I it said copyrighted Craig Stone on it, I'd get phone calls uh, from folks uh, throughout Canada and the United States, and that poster had evidently traveled all over, mm -hmm. and and they would say, "Hey, we want to talk to Craig Stone because um, we want to make a mortarboard for our daughter or niece or son who's graduating, and it says it's copyrighted." So I was. I said, no, we're all totally honored, man, that it's the poster that's copyrighted, but you can use that. So so throughout North America, uh, United States, Canada, when people graduate, they often bead or quill or make a basket, uh, whatever their tradition is, to make make a mortar board, you know. And there's, we had to actually pass a law in California to allow people to wear culturally um, connected regalia, you know, so, um, so we did that. And so now in California, at least you can wear, uh, you know, um, culturally appropriate uh, regalia at, at your, uh, at your uh, graduation. It's a great, that's a great story and a great history. So you've traveled from community member to student to professor. And for the last 10 years, you've been the director of the American Indian Studies program. Yeah. And you've talked a little bit already about how deep the roots are. And from my understanding, the oldest program of its kind west of the Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we started uh, so many years ago. And, um, and we've always had this community connection, you know. Um, what what happened was uh, we we entered an economic crisis about a decade ago, and uh, so Africana Studies was being um, turned into a de from a department to a program, and American Indian Studies we were being proposed that we would no longer have autonomy as a program, and um, and I never wanted to be the director of Indian Studies. I was content, you know, to be both of these things, <laughs> but our director died. So, 
At that time, we served under 200 students. Um, and today, uh, I checked this last week, we now serve, teach to 997 students each semester. Incredible so class. so that's a huge mm -hmm. thing. But before, uh, the director prior to me <laughs> had this concept that they, it would be like siloed up. In other words, like we'd be like this strong tree, but we wouldn't interact with other folk. And uh, so when I became the director, um, really, when you when you are working in different contexts across, you know, uh, you realize what they're missing. And what always showed up for me, anyway, was that was that there's all this information and value that we have in Native Studies, but um, uh, people may not be aware of that. So. And one of the missions of Indian studies was to somehow impact the daily lives of Indians. So, so social work, for instance, um, at the time didn't have any courses dealing with the Indian Child Welfare Act. Well, if social workers graduate, they don't know about Indian Child Welfare, then that's very problematic for for people who are Native who are in the system. So, so we approached them and created a class, American Indian Families. Harold Sonota teaches that today. Mm -hmm. And and so what we realized, we have this specialization in knowledge. And in the arts, there's something called the American Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Well, they didn't have any information about that. So we created 20 partnerships across the university and 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 brought our faculty to be able to help them to help native people who, when they graduate, they're going to impact their lives. So that's that was the concept. And then our partnerships with the uh, engineering, uh, we restored the uh, tiot, the the plank canoe of the Tongva Gabrielino people on campus. They paid for the space. They gave us space. They paid. They got grants. So our model was more about being interconnected. It was more rhizomatic. Mm -hmm. That we weren't this big tree. oak tree on a hill, but that we were like this like this plant, you know, that just sprung up all over. And and um and we have all those partnerships still. Mm -hmm. So so uh understanding your value is important, you know, and you can't understand that unless you also understand these other groups. So mm -hmm. we've partnered with all these different colleges and all these different folks. Yeah. So the program has really grown and thrived under your leadership and not the partnerships, the growth in students, also the growth in, in faculty. So you've gone from one tenure line faculty to five, plus two full-time lecturers, another dozen or so part-time faculty, um, and collectively representing about 20 different tribal groups. So yeah. what are you most excited about when you look to the program's future, given all that growth over time? Uh, well, you know, when we came as students, uh, uh, that first day of class, uh, 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 what we realized is that we were we were collaborating with uh, all the ethnic studies departments, so that's that's kind of our legacy right off the bat, and then um, and so we had that feeling um, uh, of this collaboration with ethnic studies, and so for 25 years I was on something called CSU Ethnic Studies Council, and uh, we were trying uh, to support. Uh, this uh, ethnic studies, but comparative ethnic studies, you know, where we would learn other people's stories and it, we weren't just telling our own story. So um, eventually uh, we were on a chancellor's task force. We wrote uh, these recommendations and then eventually AB 1460, um, that's uh, Dr. Shirley Weber sponsored a bill. So we, we now have a requirement in the CSU to uh, take an ethnic studies course. When we were working with all these students in the school districts, what we did was we would ask them, after they had taken a class, we teach high school co level courses, mm -hmm. and they count for both college and high school, but we would do exit interviews with all those students. And if they took a class, say, in Chicano Studies intro, then we'd ask them, what class do you want to take now? And they would say, oh, we want to take second one, second Chicano Studies class. But if we taught them with this ethnic studies, comparative ethnic studies model, then we then what would happen? We'd ask them, "What do you what do you want to learn about now?" 
and they'd say, you know, uh, I have a lot of uh, Salvadorian, Tongan, Samoan, Armenian students at my high school. I want to learn about them. Mm -hmm. So that's what we were trying to do, yeah. you know, to try to help to create an educated California citizenry that, that understood that struggle isn't just your own struggle mm -hmm. and that, that we have shared struggle. That is uh, important. Mm -hmm. um, so we're creating a master's right now in comparative ethnic studies, as well as growing our native studies courses. Mm -hmm. All very exciting. And it, it's all aligning with the rhizomatic strategy that you were speaking about, just yeah. uh, making those connections at the state level, at the campus level. Oh, yeah. 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 We work with legislators. And <laughs> <laughs> so to turn, turn to our um, campus, you've been advocating for many years for recognition and protection of Pavagna, all the way back to when you were a student in the 1970s. So can you talk a little bit about Pavagna and why yeah. it is so important to California Indian peoples and, and beyond? California is a really unique place, you know. It's linguistically and culturally the most diverse place in North America for thousands of years. There's over 100 uh, California Indian tribes. Uh, that are federally recognized, and an equal number who are not. And there's over 100 languages spoken. So the thing about Puvungna, which is often translated as the gathering place, it's the oldest continuously inhabited Gabrielino Tongo village site. But more importantly, it is the birthplace of the people. In that, this, their sacred narratives, they talk about uh, Puvungna as the place where they change from being pre-human form to human form. So it is the point of emergence for the Tongva Gabrielino people. It's also uh, the place where Chinichinich, who was a Tobot, a spiritual leader from Pimu, which uh, people know as Santa Catalina Island, uh, he came to Puvungna and he brought these laws and created a spiritual philosophy. Uh, so this, quote, religion uh, traveled and it travels out into Arizona, throughout the desert and into northern Mexico, to northern Baja. So so the impact of this place as a spiritual center, as a place of gathering, as a place of fellowship, as a place of study, right, and spiritual awakening, that, that's Cal State Long Beach. Mm -hmm. And we know that because there are these springs, historic springs, and there's one by the Japanese Garden and the others by Rancho Los Alamitos. So that's all really important stuff. When we were students, uh, again, all these all these female uh, students, they they were really the ones who kind of got us all going. And we went to visit Stephen Horn, who was the president, and we'd found out that they were trenching on campus for the Japanese garden, and, and they disturbed or desecrated a grave, and that the remains of that person was taken to the archaeology lab. So when we found out about that, we went down there, and uh, we thought we were all bad, you know. And we went to, <laughs> to talk to Stephen Horn for to go demand, you know. And uh, and Stephen was like, oh, my gosh, what's going on, you guys? Like, I can't believe this happened. Let's rebury. Let's rebury on campus. Mm -hmm. And you can have this area, and we'll plant plants. And so over the years, we've had situations where, you know, some people's concepts would be, let's go jack them up. But some of our teachers were really rooted in their native thought, like Hotona Roebuck. And she would say, okay, we've got a conflict. Let's go make friends for life. Hmm. And we'd go in there and she'd say, just watch, fellas. And, and, and she would start, turn the whole situation around. And we then had allies. So if it wasn't for that, mm -hmm. you know, because we were active in the movement. I was a, a second lead singer on the American Indian movement drum, you know. So we were all involved with that. We knew how to jack people up, stuff mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. But what was new to me was this kind of wisdom that Hotona Roebuck and our other uh, faculty would talk about. Like, let's go, let's go help them to understand. So there was a kinder, gentler way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's through all these different people's leadership like that, that made us into a kind of culture that's not, you know, like a revenge culture. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's more than one way yeah. to, to lead. Yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, well, speaking of your um, your talents in singing and, and other um, creative acts, earlier this year you were the uh, head male dancer in yeah. the 50th annual powwow on campus 
And it's the third time that you've served in this role, going all the way back yeah. through all your sort of lives at Cal State Long Beach as an undergraduate student in 1978, yeah. as a faculty member in 1989. Mm -hmm. So what did this third, third time conferring of this honor mean to you as you're in your retirement phase? Well, uh, you know, one thing was uh, it's an honor to be asked and to serve. And I was a fancy dancer, and there were all these young fancy dancers mm -hmm. when we were kids, people I looked up to. And I was, first day of class, the teacher showed me fancy dancing in the class, mm -hmm. Super 8 film. His name was Melvin Deer. So, mm -hmm. so I was really connected to that, and, and, uh, and I admired all these dancers. So I had a big special, at, at, and, uh, and all these dancers came out from out of state, and, they, and you had to be 65 or over. And uh, what was cool about all those dancers, they all spoke their language. They all spoke their tribal language. Mm -hmm. And they had all danced in L.A. So, uh, so that was a, ni a nice thing, you know. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, uh, in 78, my mom was there, and, mm -hmm. and my daughter came out as a dancer, a shawl dancer, and Charlotte Standing Buffalo spoke for my family and actually paid for and sponsored my giveaway. So, <clears throat> so, so part of it is also that sadness, you know, mm -hmm. that my mom wasn't there. Yeah. Um, uh, I was a candy striper in, uh, in high school and we worked in convalescent homes and people would die the day after their birthday, the day after Christmas and the day after Thanksgiving. We'd go in there and they wouldn't be in their bed. And so my mom, she died the day after our powwow in 2015. Mm -hmm. Because it was a big reunion, yes. you know, and you see all your extended family and people who <clears throat> you have yeah. known for your whole life, you know. Yeah. So, so there's always for me a kind of, um, uh, geez, I wish they were here to see this, you know. At the same time, I like I like doing it, but but I like uh, putting other people in the light rather than standing in the light. Uh, I like this notion of. Uh, of trying to encourage other people to be a headman dancer, so so I hadn't done that for a long time, you know. Uh, so yeah, we're here in October of 2023. Yeah, and it's decades after you very first attended powwow. Mm -hmm. What are the lessons that you carry and that you want to share with your students, with your colleagues? And really, this is a question about your legacy. What do you oh. what do you want your legacy to be? Hmm. <clears throat> well, I ain't done yet. Um, <laughs> so that's part of it. You know, I think our lifespans now, I'm going to retire two years from now at 70, mm -hmm. but, you know, I might have 40 years. Yeah. So, uh, so, so that what I would, what I would like, you know, to see is that, that uh, all these new faculty, we've hired awesome people. I'd like to see them realize uh, what they want to realize, mm -hmm. you know, how they see things going. Uh, and and um, I think there's uh, <clears throat> just some base, really basic things. We have all these songs. So we have a song that was given to us for our student council. And that in that song, it says, it says, um, respect one another, take care of one another, have empathy for each other. And, and that song is the song that you sing when they first have their first meeting. So there's all this really strong, uh, smart, uh, healthy ways of being that are thousands of years old. Uh, and we just have little pieces of it. So um, we have a student encouragement song, you know, that encourages people to graduate, you know. Um, and I think that uh, I would hope that we don't lose those songs and we don't lose those traditions because what happens with our American Indian students when they come, that they're welcome the way I was welcomed, mm -hmm. right? And that, and that th these folks and our faculty are doing it now. They are mentoring, they're helping. So just understand you're part of a continuum, you know, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And that we depend on each other. You know, it's we depend on each other. Well, thank you, Professor Stone, for sharing your story, for sharing your wisdom and all the deep history that you bring. And if anything, that is at least the beginning of your legacy, understanding that you have many, many years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you for being here today.
Thank you, Deb.